For those of you who are new, my name is Michael, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Um, Dr. Bernard Kutsia is a biologist, and he's a global change scientist, but one of his big passions is light pollution. Uh, he comes to us this evening from the small base camp or the small town of Skakuza in the Kruger National Park in the northern part of South Africa. How are you doing this evening? Are you well? And maybe you could start at the very beginning. How did this fascination of light pollution start? Uh, was it from an early age? Um, yeah, hello, hello everyone. Hello, Michael. Um, I, I wonder if I could show my face for a second, if I could stop sharing, just so people could put a... Um, can people see that or is that the screen? Yes, we can see you. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, let's hope it doesn't cut out while we, while we talk, but um, yeah, looking forward to, to sharing some thoughts uh, about, about light pollution, which is sort of a new, a new issue in the environmental radar uh, with you tonight. Um, and I'll, I'll share my screen quickly. Yeah, I think um, I, am a, I am a terrible and amateurish astrophotographer. Um, and that's what, what you're usually doing in astrophotography is trying to get to what we call dark sites. Um, and so we routinely just avoid light pollution areas. And you can look at a map and you go, you climb in a car and you drive far away. Um, but I, I never really made the connection with that as a biologist until a colleague of mine that works uh, I do a lot of work on, on wilderness thinking and protected areas, um, sort of pointed out to me the obvious that um, light pollution might be eroding a lot of the, the values we seek in protected areas and in wilderness experiences. Um, and I, I it building, but then I, I started thinking about the biology of it um, and it sort of led me down a path about, about light pollution itself and trying to understand it. Um, yeah, and so I guess tonight is, is, a, is a science light uh, talk. It, it's not technical. It's, it's very much a, a chat or a discussion about uh, some of my thoughts around the topic. I, I must up front say I'm, I'm by no means a, a, like a light pollution expert. I don't call myself a light pollution person. Um, I, I guess it's, it's, it's more correct to say I'm a global change scientist, um, and I usually study things like habitat transformation and climate change. Uh, but I've increasingly gotten interested in light pollution as a, as a global change driver. And hopefully I can convince you tonight that, that it potentially is um, a, a problem at scale. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm trying to transition my slides. There we go. So just, just in terms of a formal introduction, uh, I'm a research fellow at the Global Change Institute at the University of Witwatersrand. It's uh, based in uh, Johannesburg, but as Michael was saying, I'm, I'm talking to you from Skakuza, the small little town that's the administrative hub of the Kruger National Park. And so I'm, I'm fortunate that I can live in what's, what's by many considered a really iconic wilderness area and, and also a dark sky site. And here I teach for the Organization for Tropical Studies, so I teach uh, mainly conservation but also ecological topics um, in, in field studies um, and I've, I've also uh, put up the South African National Parks and University of Exeter emblems there because my colleagues are based there that have really spurned on a lot of my thinking about about light pollution. Um, so let's start off with a bit of context. Um, I think but I'll, I'll keep this image up for a while and, and, and hopefully um, can provide some context in the background. But this is the, what's called the, 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 the Earthrise photograph. It was photographed uh, by Apollo 8 in the, in the mid-1960s in preparation for NASA's landing of, of astronauts on the moon. And so it's been called the most in, influential picture in environmental history. It's, it's, uh, you might have seen it before. Um, because it's so striking, right? It's the, it's the blue marble suspended in space and really puts us sort of, uh, I guess, in our place in the universe. That's, that's one of the reasons I got into astrophotography in the first place. But what I want to draw your attention to, you know, I think is, is the negative space, right? And so in a creative sense, I think people are always drawn to the, to the picture itself. But the universe is an exceedingly dark place. It's actually very dark and it's not filled with a lot of stuff. Um, and we're in a very unique position that we just happen to be close to a star that's emitting a lot of light. And so at least 
or a portion of the day, uh, there's life on the planet. Now, most of the life on the planet has evolved in, in these day-night cycles. Um, from the beginning of the, of the evolution of all the life on, on Earth, including ourselves, um, we've been subjected to these day-night cycles. And darkness is, in fact, the, the natural state. It's very common, you know, it happens every day. Uh, but we tend to forget, I'm sitting in the dark, mainly now in my office, we tend to forget that, you know, somewhere, most on the opposite of the planet, while we go about our business in the daytime, it's in complete darkness. Uh, and what I hope to show you is, is, is that's actually when a lot of the action happens. If, you, if you've been up to the, the Kruger National Park, for instance, you know, it, a night drive is the highlight because that's when the predators and things are active. And this, this is a fundamental shift in how we think about ecology. Um, it's, it's emerging as a, a separate field. It's called nighttime ecology. And it's not just about studying animals and what they do at night, but really fundamentally asks if we're a, a, a diurnal species, one that's day active, how much are we missing that's happening um, at night and, uh, and the ecology of the nighttime. Okay, and so that's, that's quite an important point because at the surface of the planet, if we zoom into that, it, it looks something like this. And so this is from the International Space Station. You can just see the, the part of the, um, the construction there. And this is Portugal and there's Madrid and you can see Barcelona in the distance. Um, because over time, we've systematically introduced artificial lights at night uh, into the natural environment. And so in the Popular media, it's called light pollution. Just for ease of reference, I'll call it light pollution uh, tonight, but it's, it's really um, artificial light at night. Uh, and not all of it's bad. Of course, this is extended leisure hours, it's extended work hours, uh, but I think there are trade-offs in our development and what the introduction of light into this very dark universe uh, is really doing to us and is really doing to, to species and the species that I study. Um, if you, if you zoom in furthermore, this is a Times Square at night. It's perpetually lit. Uh, it is the most, it's, it's an, <laughs> an extremely lit place. And it's in the city that never sleeps, right? And so these lights are constantly on. Um, and so that, that's maybe an extremist example, but I'll show you that, that it's, this is actually quite commonplace in different places. Um, okay, and so this, this is a map produced by a team led by Fabian Falci. Uh, um, I think... He's Italian, I think, at a Roman institution um, in scientific reports. And so they, it's called the, the, the Atlas of Nighttime Lights, right? It's, it's worth a Google. And, and most of this information is now available um, on sort of online sources if, you, if you're interested in maps and things. Um, and so there are some, some really striking patterns. If, if I, I, I spend a lot of my time staring at maps because um, I come from a biogeography background. Um, and study species distributions. And so the, the first thing that might strike you is that there's congruence between human population density and light pollution, right? And so that's, that's quite an obvious point. It's, it's, yeah, the line is where the humans are living. And so you can see China and India, for instance, extremely lit. Uh, Europe and, and North America, um, uh, let's not worry too much about the gradient scale, but it goes from black, which is obviously dark, to sort of red, which is intense, to white, which is, which is very intense. Um, uh, and then I'll zoom into Africa for a second. Uh, most of, of uh, Australia, of course, is completely dark and Antarctica uh, completely dark because there are no people there. And so, like I said, I, I study wilderness and, and what that means and the erosion of wilderness globally. And one of the indicators we use to do that is, um, is, is light, right? It's the global uh, footprint of humans can be measured in a variety of ways, but one of that is, is the distribution of light because it's increasing globally. Um, I think, I don't have the stats in front of me, but it's, it's about two thirds of the world's population now lives under light polluted skies. And so when they look up at the night sky, they can't see things like the Milky Way. So the Milky Way is, is you know, sort of uh, fundamental to my upbringing. It had a lot of uh, influence in my life, but uh, many people um, have never seen it. And, and sort of as a segue, um, I don't know how true this is, it's like, it's like one of those urban myths of urban legends. But in the early 90s, there was a, there was a, uh, a major power cut in Los Angeles, in downtown LA. And um, the 911, the emergency services there, were inundated with calls from people because they were reporting this weird disc in the sky, right? Um, and of course, it was the Milky Way. They'd, they'd just never seen it before because if you grew up in downtown LA, this is all you would have seen. This is this um, light polluted sky. 
because all the celestial objects are, are completely blotted out. So I find that extraordinary. I find it extraordinary that people have sort of lost this connection um, to the night sky. Uh, none of my talk is, is about that, but I you know, sort of what got me into all of it. Um, and so that's, it's striking. I, I'm talking tonight about a biological perspective, um, but the astronomers are petrified about light pollution because it's physically eroding their ability to study optically the night sky. It's, it's their whole field is in, in jeopardy. And this is why these telescopes uh, get built in these remote places like Sutherland, um, where there's no human infrastructure and, and light pollution influencing the, the optical quality of, of the images. Okay, so if we zoom into Africa, just, just for a bit of detail, you can see um, uh, North Africa, so a lot of, uh, also historically, a lot of uh, buildings, a lot of human infrastructure around the coast. Nigeria and Lagos, uh, now the most almost densely populated city in the world. Um, and I'll zoom into South Africa for in a second. But most of Africa is, is quite dark. I think that, that says something about um, the levels of human infrastructure, of course, yeah, human population densities are quite low. Um, but the important point to make, and I'll highlight this at different uh, time periods, is that Africa is sort of at the cusp of its, of its developmental um, growth, right? The, the de developmental renaissance, they, um, some, in some circles they call it. And so the, we, we are coming into a position where we are turning into a, a very much more light polluted continent than, than other places in the world which has some risks and it has some opportunities. Okay, so, so this is the, that same data sort of zoomed into South Africa, as you would expect, much of the Karoo is, is quite dark. Um, and I, if, if this was a classroom, I'd, I'd sort of point to this little blob at the bottom there off the coast of South Africa and say, you know, what do you think that is? Um, so maybe just give that a bit of thought while I point out some other features. Notice Cape Town is now, um, uh, you know, sort of New York level lights. Notice how much of that light actually bleeds into um, the, the atmosphere and into the ocean, right? This is for mile, kilometers and kilometers offshore. Um, these light pollution effects are, are being felt. I mainly work in terrestrial systems and with terrestrial species, but the marine world is getting even scarier. And so some work out of South Africa actually can demonstrate how uh, hunting behavior of predatory fishes is changing because of light pollution from offshore, um, from, from inland. And so this, I suspect, is, is actually a chaka fishery. So ch chaka uh, fisheries use lights to attract them up, up into the, up into the um, upper water column and then people can catch those fish. Um, and so I, I don't know what time series this particular data set was not put together, but I suspect that's what they we're picking up there. Um, if, if it helps the, the sort of international people, if you can follow my cursor, I'm sort of right on the edge of this, uh, this blob of light here at the bottom. Um, and so all of this is the Kruger National Park. I'll zoom into that in a second. Um, so the South Africans might be able to, to follow here, but let me just talk, talk you through some of the geography. You can see the outline of the Kruger National Park here. Uh, again, this is all light pollution. Um, and this is the town of Palaboa, which has a mining complex that you can actually see from space. It's a, it's a really terrifying, it's one of the biggest man-man holes on the planet. Um, but this facility runs 365, 24-7. Right? That's the only way the mine is profitable. Um, and of course, this is New York level lighting uh, on that mine as they're trying to, to always keep these big trucks and these big open excavations going. Um, and I, I'll, I'll mention it in, in, as we go along, but a lot of the, the work I'm trying to, to get off the ground is based around this area because suddenly there's this massive gradient of light uh, into a natural area and we can control for all sorts of other things like vegetation. Um, and so these very strong light gradients don't exist in, in other exemplar study areas. It's a really neat place to do experimental work. And maybe from a developmental side, um, this is Guyani. Guyani is a, used to be a sleepy small town. My father is a, is a, was a doctor there in the 70s and you know, it was a, uh, nothing going on there. Now it's you know, uh, roads and infrastructure and towns. Um, and you can see in the surrounding areas, these, these pockets of, of um, villages popping up are actually very well lit, right? And so we, we, um, on the ground, we're not quite sure what's going on there, but it's, it's sort of an indication of how um, a lot of Africa is getting, is getting online. It's, it'll, it'll begin with these sort of pockets of light and eventually they'll sort of connect the dots 
as the infrastructure grows. Okay, and so I guess that, that, that sort of a broad overview of the extent of the problem, like I said, in a, in a non-technical sense introduced, um, but, I, but I maybe just to, to set the context for what we'll discuss tonight is, is this very striking image of, of sociable weavers um, with the Milky Way in the background sort of creeping up here in the corner is, is what's termed sky glow. And so maybe at this juncture I can say there the, the are mainly two classes of light pollution. Um, the one is point source light, and so that's, that's light directly from a, from a light bulb or a, a spotlight if you want in a field or lighting a building, for instance. Um, and, and so that's point source light pollution. And mu much of the scientific work that's been conducted is, is on point source light because it's obviously a bit easier to study and it's easier to manipulate experimentally. Uh, but this stuff sort of creeping up in the corner here from a town uh, on the outskirts of the Kalahari is, is sky glow. And so sky glow is, is sort of all the point source pollution combined and how it's diffusing through uh, particles in the atmosphere, right? Um, and so it spreads out from these point source solutions. And so that picture I showed you of Cape Town uh, really is that sort of sort of light that's that's burning off through the atmosphere. Um, and from a biological sense, people have tended to ignore this because it sort of seems diffuse and not as important. Um, and how, how could this light possibly affect organisms close by? But since we've been, we, we the Royal We scientists, have, have really been studying this um, over the past 10 to 15 years, we can actually demonstrate now that even at low intensities, there are very fundamental disruptions in the biology of species. And so that means sky glow is probably a much, much bigger um, impact than, than we, we might perceive. Even at low intensities, light pollution might have impacts. Okay, and so this is one of my two technical sort of figures. Um, that's a phylogenetic tree, uh, which we needn't worry too much about tonight. But um, it's just the evolutionary relationships between species. What I want to draw your attention on is, is that this is a, you know, these are all individual mammal species and they're coded by colors. And if they blue, it's nocturnal. So that means the, the behavior no, and under normal conditions, the behavior of that species is restricted to nighttime. Um, diurnal is, is the daytime. So that's the yellow sort of colors. Um, and note that already most mammals in the world are, are nocturnal, they're not diurnal. Um, then there's crepuscular, that means they have bouts of activity during sundown and sunset. So at the switching of light uh, between daytime to nighttime or nighttime to dark, daytime, uh, there's this, these episodic events of activity. And cathermal um, is sort of um, a weird category where species have bouts of activity, not restricted to either nocturnal or diurnal. And so like I say, the key bit, of course, the, the bats, Chiroptera, um, of course, they're all nocturnal. And so they take a big chunk of space at the bottom of the graph here. Uh, but most species are nocturnal. That's when the action happens. It's not actually in the daytime. And we happen to study things in the daytime because we're primates, right? We're one of the few groups that are actually busy in the daytime. Uh, most things are asleep. And that's, that, sounds, that sounds like a, um, um, a trivial uh, observation, but the, the consequences of this might be profound because the most of the work we do is not when the ecology is actually happening. Um, and so that's a broad point. There's, there's some fantastic work by a colleague, um, oh, his name will come up a couple of times, but Kevin Gasson. And so they've, for those who are more from an academic background, they just published some work in American Naturalist, which is an interesting journal about nighttime ecology and what this, these sort of observations mean for our study of ecology. So if you, if you think that was a controversial statement, <laughs> go check out the manuscript and it'll give you a bit more context. Um, and so this is another striking image uh, at, and this is completely at night. It looks like it, and this is not a manipulated image at all. Um, this is just a, a very good photographer. This is in Indiana in the US, and he's photographing two different cities that you, that you can see on the, on the horizon. Um, this is Jupiter and that's Saturn, if that's of interest. Uh, but what I want to draw your attention to is that if you, if you look at the color grading on, the, on your screen, I hope that comes across well, is that they are, it's actually in two different spectra, right? And so spectra are like the, the rainbow colors that the different lights occur in. So what's really, really important is that the spectral signatures of lighting differs. And these have different consequences onto biological systems because um, of how the spectral signatures affect uh, melatonin production. And so I, I'll, I'll touch on that a bit later. Uh, but yeah, this, this, the spectral changes between the different lights is, is really interesting and, and striking. And you can see it in this very well in the, on the photograph. 
Um, and so Michael asked me to, to speak a, a lot about, or, or some about the, the, the human aspects um, or how it's affecting uh, humanity. And I, I sort of, because I'm not a medical doctor, I thought I'd, I'd keep it brief. Um, and here's sort of a one slide overview of what some of the potential uh, medical impacts might be. One of the reasons um, is that this is a really new field. Um, it's, it's sort of, uh, some of my colleagues that, that work here call, call light pollution the, the smoking of the 70s, right? In the 1960s, 70s, if you said smoking causes cancer, people would laugh at you. It, it, it was not considered a carcinogen. It was not considered important. Um, but now we think that light pollution might just be one of the primary disruptors, certainly in circadian rhythms, and so that's the sleep-night cycle, but also of hormonal, hormonal balances inside the human body. And so the, the main mechanism here is, is melatonin, which is the hormone that's regulated in, or that expresses um, um, day, night, and sleep cycles. And so melatonin makes you, makes you tired, right? But it's stimulated by light, um, which enters through our, our visual systems and it's produced in the, in the pineal gland um, inside the brain. Um, and so the idea is that under artificial light, and so disruptions in our natural circadian rhythms, there's a, there's a, a suppression of the expression of melatonin. Um, and melatonin is also uh, um, reduces free radicals, right? And so these are the things that could cause cancers. Um, and so there's a link between melatonin production and cancer risk, especially so in people uh, that do shift work. So uh, nurses, for instance, or people who do mining, so that, you know, they're busy in, in odd hours uh, under artificial light. Um, and so this link is now really being explored medically. It's to the extent that the World Health Organization cons considers that light pollution might be a carcinogen in, inside the human body. Um, and like I said, this is still a really, really active field. Um, you, you might be able to think for yourself that uh, you stay up at night and there's a lot of screen time, you keep the lights on, it, it has all sort of things like impairing your memory and makes it harder to learn. And that's also linked to, to tiredness, of course. Uh, but there's increasing work to show that light pollution might be um, linked to depression levels because how it's expressed. Another interesting one is obesity risk um, because the disruption of these melatonin sleep cycles, um, it's, it's linked also to hunger. And so how, how this is disrupting uh, these sort of things like obesity risk is, is also still active uh, research. And I see, I, I don't, I'm not aware of this work, but I see this, they have a tab up here on, on cataracts. It, it might also be included in, into that. And so I guess the, the, the takeaway here is to say that uh, light pollution may, might have quite severe um, consequences to our health, but it's, it's something that's really getting explored a lot more in the medical field. And also to say that not all light is, is bad, of course, right? And so light is actively used as treatments for a variety of ailments, uh, including jaundice in, in newborns and infants. I mean, that's a very long-standing um, way to treat um, some of these very pernicious diseases. Uh, I think the point is that, that it's been underappreciated. It's underappreciated how lights and the disruption of circadian rhythms via melatonin expression is affecting our, our health. And so if, if, if you come from a medical background or this is of interest, I'd, I'd say keep, keep an eye on this because it's going to become really, really big science in the next, the next couple of years is, is sort of a prediction. Okay, but I mainly work in the natural world. Um, and so I'll highlight some of the, those examples. Um, the, the, the bottom line is that the, the examples of how light is affecting the natural world are exploding exponentially. Just about everywhere people look, um, the light is having an effect. And so in terms of a change driver, that really asks the question, to what extent are we actually, uh, for example, saying that climate change might is causing these big scale um, changes, especially in the phenology of species, but it might actually be due to light. And so light triggers the, the budding of plants, for instance, right? Um, and so if you introduce light artificially into an environment that hasn't experienced it, some of these plants will bud earlier. And so for, for many years, we thought this was an impact of climate change, for instance, it's the, it's the heating signature and that's what's making plants bud earlier, uh, but it might be due to artificial light. Now, now, demonstrating that is tricky. It's been done in the lab and it's been done in, in, in sort of smaller microcosm experiments, demonstrating the extent to which light is a change driver, driving, you know, at that scale is, is still 
sort of uh, ongoing. I think, there, like I say, a lot of people are focusing work on it. This this slide is sort of one of the famous examples that this is this is very old work. It, it came out in the, I think in the 70s was the original paper um, to show that that sea turtles that hatch on beaches get disorientated by artificial lights, and that's because the the hatchlings use the, the moonlight on on the ocean to orientate themselves, and they see these glistening on the beaches, and they just sort of head for that. But if they you know in big beach resorts, if they artificial lights on the inside of the shores, um, they get attracted to it, right? And so one of the major disruptors of light is, is in terms of orientation for species. Um, because some, some, some species are, are, are photophilic and some are, um, uh, what's the opposite? They, they, they demonstrate a phototaxic response to light. So some species are really attracted to it. Right? Like they see light, they, they just cruise into it. And it's not always bad. Um, and so, so many insects get attracted to artificial lights. You'd know if you put on a light in a, in a tropical area. Uh, but this this can attract bats that feed off the lights, right? And so they very quickly learn to exploit um, artificial lighting and increase the dominance, right? And so, for, you know, it might be bad news for the moths, but it's great news for the bats. And then conversely, there are bat species that perceive lights um, as, a, as an obstacle, right? And so uh, this was some, I don't have a nice slide of that, but there's some work to demonstrate with transmitters put onto bats uh, in artificial lit environments, they avoid it. They fly through the dark spaces and they fly around the lights and they head back to the dark spaces, right? So not all bad species do this, but some of them really get affected by it, right? They see the lights going and they, they, they try and avoid it. And so figuring out which is which is, is, is quite, uh, like I say, an active, active part of work and research. And so, so this is um, some work by uh, Marcus Byrd in a, in a large large group of people um, at Wits University, that's the University of the Witwatersrand in, in Johannesburg. And this work is on, on dung beetles, which are this iconic group in Africa that form a little ball uh, and the beetle pushes this along um, along a path. And you, you might have seen images or, or heard, of, heard of that before, or seen it in the field. Um, and now some early work by Clark Skultz um, at the University of Pretoria showed that, that these dung beetles orientate and, and navigate by all, using all sorts of light, right? including celestial light. So the way that the Milky Way orientates at night, they can orientate themselves and they use that for navigation. So it's a, it's a critical a visual aid actually to help them navigate. And of course, if you introduce light pollution through sky glow, it has the potential to disorientate. Right? And so what they do here is under different light regimes, test the navigation ability of these dung beetles um, to, to see the influence of light. And they're showing uh, all, all sorts of interesting things, including that the dung beetles can adapt quite quicker than we think. Uh, they get disorientated, but they sort of figure out, hang on, you know, something isn't quite right here, and they just sort of adapt their vision systems and they, they cruise off. And so, um, yeah, this, this, this sort of stuff is really fascinating. I think if anything goes, demonstrates to what extent species really cue into different um, forms of light. Okay, I hope this image has popped up yet. This is a... For the bird is out, this is a fire neck nightjar. This is a like a conic species that occurs across uh, most of Africa uh, in the warmer areas. And nightjars are a group, if, you, if you're not a birder, let me take you some, through some of these characters. A nightjar as a group have these extraordinarily huge eyes, right? I mean, the size of the species, you can see just how much investment has gone into the evolution of this, this eye. It's, it's by far a, a, a real visual predator. And it has these little pronounced bristles around the edge of the, the, the beak. And so what these guys do is they, they, they're called walking predators and they, they open up this mouth. It looks like a big funnel if they open it up. It's got this really weird big mouth. And they fly about and they, they try and catch insects uh, into these bristles, either by visually seeing them or the insect hits the bristle and they, and they grab it. And so this species is out and out a visual predator, right? And so what I would be interested to do now that uh, the technology is, is sort of caught up with, with some of our, our ideas, I guess, is to try and test to what extent light pollution is impacting the species as a, as a visual predator. And so uh, in that polar boa example I gave, that strong light pollution gradient, I suspect that, um, so the species does better on, on moonlit nights, right? Because if they can see better and it's a full moon, they just, they just have better success and they're more active. Um, and so some work in the U.S. has demonstrated this for many years. No, that's not a light pollution connection. But um, 
you know, m maybe under more or under artificial lights, other point source or sky glow, the species is more active. And so what you'd want to do is, is catch a whole string of them under different regimes and try and test uh, to what extent they, it changes their, their feeding behavior. And so that might not be a negative effect, right? If they are feeding um, more positively and more strongly, um, then, uh, yeah, it's to the benefit of the species. And I guess the point there is to try and figure out what are the costs and benefits um, of different lighting regimes for different species, right? And so this image, this is work done on insects in the UK. It, it was called the Ecolight Project. It's just sort of wrapped up to a conclusion. Um, and this, this photograph is taken by a collaborator of theirs, who's an artist. And so what each one of these little boxes are on your screen is a, mice, uh, a, a mycocosm, right? It's, a, it's like a small experimental chamber where you can, you can add different plants and you add different herbivores that eat those plants and you add different predators that eat those herbivores. And so it, on a very small scale, you can replicate um, uh, ecological community. Um, and then you, you add different lights and different light regimes to this network and see how that affects the community and, and what happens. And so to the right here, you can see this is a, a LED light. It's sort of that white, uh, what, what I would call is, is a harsher light um, and, and a lot brighter at a high intensity. And the, this orange, softer light is, is I, I guess this was the incandescent um, experiments. And then there's some of the sites are, are dark, right? So that's just normal moonlight. Um, and so each one of these is, is an experimental uh, plot or design that's distributed throughout this landscape. So this experiment, I think, ran for two years um, where they tested how the different light regimes are affecting these different communities. So the striking thing here is, and I'm drawing it back to the sky glow, this is all point source solution, right? It's from a single light source. But even at very low intensities, um, it can change the predator-prey relationships and impacts, right? And so when I say low intensities, it's sort of uh, think um, half moon, so uh, really, really dark actually. Just much less than you you when you put on your light in, in your living room, for instance. And so that demonstrates that that um, yeah that that light is is really having a, a, a tremendous effect. I think if you if you want to read more about the work, this was um, Sanders et al. I think 2019 in current biology. If you know the scientific literature, current biology is a really big, big journal. Um, yeah, and so I, I guess these are, are quite quick examples, but but sort of uh, demonstrating different kinds of uh, responses that that species are undergoing. So, Michael, at the beginning, you asked um, you asked me why why this why, why light pollution. And this was my, this is my only other technical graph. Um, and it is a, a, if I can run you through it, it's a, it's a, we have illumination and there's different ways to measure this, uh, but just in lux, just read it as intensity. And you can think like a clear sky is, is very bright, right? That's now full sunlight to when it's overcast, um, uh, when the moon is down, you know, then, then it's really, really dark. You know, so if, it's, if the moon's down and it's overcast, so that's just as, about as dark as the planet can get. Okay, and so full moon is sort of over there. And here, you, you can refer to this manuscript if you, if you want some of the details, but each one of these little arrows is the intensity at which um, a biological response has been demonstrated in the literature, right? And so, and so these range, firstly, across a range of taxa, so from my, microbes, plants, um, invertebrates, uh, mammals, birds, uh, there's a bit of work in reptiles as well, um, how they change with light, and also the kind of responses. And so there have been behavioral responses, that's mainly what I've talked about now, so changes in orientation, but also physiological responses inside the organisms, right? Changes how they, how they respond, um, their fecundity, so their breeding success, for instance, changes under different light regimes. Uh, there have been some, some work to show that, uh, like I said, in the mesocosm experiment, there have also been some um, experiments in the field to demonstrate that entire communities of insects can shift uh, based on different lights and different intensities of lights. And when I saw this, that was really when, when uh, I, I hate to make it the bun, but when the lights went on, you know, that's, that's really when the, um, the, the enormity of this issue sort of hit me. And note that this paper is, is, is not quite dated, uh, if you will, um, 
and I think ecologists are sort of waking up to the issue. And like I say, when, when people start scratching around in this stuff like I have now, it's just phenomenal. It's just uh, the literature is full of different examples of how life is, is affecting, um, affecting biological systems. Okay, and so hopefully for, for the, for the, for the non-biologists, that was a, just a quick overview of um, some, of the, some of the major issues that we face in, in light pollution. Um, or that we're thinking about in light pollution. Um, but also, like Michael said, you know, this, this isn't all doom and gloom. I don't want to paint, I don't, I don't want to add another microplastics or another uh, climate change or something like that to the, you know, we've got enough stuff to worry about, especially this year. This is not, this is not the year to wake up to new issues. And so what I want to offer you is, is a perspective to say um, that, that there are really opportunities for win-win solutions, especially so across Africa. Um, because we have the opportunity to, to not repeat the mistakes that have been made in lighting uh, in Europe and in Asia and in the Americas. And so we can go on to the correct spectral or the correct kinds of lights from the get-go, especially if we roll out um, lighting infrastructure across the continent, which is coming, right? I mean, the, this, this development is, is on the way. And so that's sort of an easy way to address some of these concerns. This is, a, this is taken from a manuscript that, that again was published by my colleague, um, Kevin Gaston. This is in Science in 2018, I think, and it's really worth a, worth a read, but it's, I'm squarely just stealing all those uh, my ideas from, from there. Okay, and so the, the first one, very, very obvious, is to, is to not introduce light uh, to, to places that it doesn't occur, right? And so, so that's, that's, of course, easier said than done. I, 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 I showed this example of wilderness, but there, there really is a, a incentive to think about how we introduce lights into different places. And so an example here, for instance, now is that when new lodges go up, um, they're very concerned about, about the view sheds, right? And view sheds is, is what the guests, for instance, can see visually when they're sitting around the camps at night. Because suddenly if there's a light on the horizon, you know that's another person. And so it takes away some of that... Um, like I guess a lure or, or a sense of it in, if you're a dollar paying tourist, but in a very practical sense, it does, uh, I think, steal some of the, the, the wilderness feeling, if that makes sense, or the, the natural feeling if you're out in, out in, the, out in nature. And so this, this, this is being championed by a variety of different organizations and people, but foremost of which, which I'm not associated with, but is this International Dark Sky Association. They're a fairly large NGO base in the US and their sole mandate is to protect large dark spaces. So Africa at the moment does uh, only has two, I think one is in the uh, portion of the Kalahari and one is in Namibia. And, and these are, are spaces that, that can demonstrate that they, not only are they dark spaces away from a lot of light pollution, but all the activities that are happening inside uh, those reserves um, are applying the kind of things that I'll talk about in the next few slides. So really trying to mitigate the light um, uh, patterns and contact, right? So a place like Skakuza, for instance, where I live, um, does not do, do this at all. Um, and so we can't qualify for, at least portions of the Kruger National Park won't qualify as a dark sky site until these things are rolled in um, through management. And like, like uh, maybe just another point which is worth laboring, some of these Solutions, you know, they, I'm talking about really large scale processes and political instruments and governments and municipals. But these sort of um, solutions really scale extremely well to the level of the individual. Um, and so think about this as an individual, how you can change these sort of um, things in, in your own household or your neighbors or talk to them about it. Um, but basically, don't introduce light where you don't, where you don't need it and where you don't use it, um, I think is, is the point there. Um, okay, and so the, the other one is, is to use light in low intensities. And so the image there is, is of sunlight, right? Remember that, that your body responds to sunlight. It's, it responds to the, these intense photons that are coming from this star that we happen to be very close to. And so what most of the engineers have tried to do since the 1750s is replicate that kind of light. Right, they've tried to make these very blue spectrum intense lights, uh, like LED lights that can roll out in places and be energy efficient and really light up the, the, the hell out of a place. But that is exactly the light that you have the strongest biological response to. 
know, that organisms respond the strongest to in, in most cases, right? And so it, it needed to always be this strong, strong uh, light. Uh, and remember that even at low intensities, lights can have biological consequences in, in, in you as well. And so the, the, the trick in um, more global scale and for yourself is to use light at sort of lower intensities. And then the, the um, another key one is, is to use direct light, directed light, right? And so a key challenge is to, to reduce stress pass. And so that's light that's sort of burning away or focusing on places that you don't really need it, sort of just going out in the atmosphere. And so the, the worst example, of course, is just a light that's out uh, like um, without a shielding and it's just bleeding off the light all over the place, right? And so unfortunately, most of the lights fall into this category because people haven't really thought about reducing light, the light pollution signature, right? That's, that's what I guess I'm trying to get across is that you don't, all your lights don't have to look like this. <coughs> the best, sorry, the best is if, if you can provide shielding and there are a lot of light fixtures now that come out with this, um, this I, I don't even want to call it technology. It, it, it's such a simple solution to, to try and reduce light pollution. And you only illuminate the area of interest, right? Whether it's your outdoor garage or uh, whatever your um, whatever you're trying to light. Um, and so, yeah, that that would be a key a key uh, point. And the other thing is is adjust the timing of lighting. And so, yeah, I, I've used the level of individual as an important one, but also think about it at, at larger scales, right? Um, the the you know. Um, the advice is to not use um, screens, you know, just because of the stimulation effect. You know, if you're watching Netflix at 10 o'clock at night, you're going to struggle to switch your brain off. But you can prepare your, your literally your melatonin expression in your body to increase um, and increase your, your feeling of tiredness uh, before you go to bed. And remember that when you use these devices and use light, it's, it's actively trying to keep you awake, right? That's, that's just uh, manipulating the the hormonal uh, pathways. And so you can think about different ways uh, to do that, I'll, I'll, you know, and, and using, of course, less intensities of lights uh, to try and reduce your melatonin expression. Um, but of course, this could be at, at much broader scales as well. And so what we're trying to roll out in the park, for instance, is, is light switches at some of the campsites, right? And so it's only motion activated once you enter the facility, then it switches on. Um, and so, of course, that's energy efficient, right? Because the lights just switch off and then you don't have to pay for it. Um, but, but it also reduces light pollution in an environment that's, that's naive, light naive. It's, you know, some of these camps are really dark and the, the species there, especially some of the insect species, have never seen artificial lights in the life cycles before. And so that's a simple solution to, one, save energy, but also reduce the environmental impact. Um, and it's the, the technicians here, sort of looked dumbfounded when we first started suggesting it and they were just like, yeah, well, that's pretty easy. They can just roll it out without, without too much trouble. I guess that's a lot of the point we're trying to make now is to say that, you know, these, these consequences of light pollution might be extremely severe, but with a bit of astute thinking, we can make it more energy efficient and cheaper and, and roll out sort of better lights. Um, and then I, I, I use this example to say, use, use warmer lights. Warm in the, in the lighting world is, is sort of away from the blue spectrum lights to more what you call orangey glow, um, and yellowish glow lights. And so the example here is, is this is a bar on the left, right? This is a nice welcoming, you know, you just want to sit down and have a whiskey. This is the hospital room that's all sort of LED and phosphorescent lights and, you know, that just looks harsh and, and terrible. And so ask yourself, where would you feel more comfortable um, in the bar or in the, in the hospital room? And so the point really there is to try and um, you know, better exploit uh, uh, natural lighting regimes. Um, I've, I've started to do this a lot in my household, and it's, it's just a lot more pleasant, right? It makes the rooms more warm and welcoming than they can't be using uh, very harsh lights. Uh, maybe just a point that, you know, it might have sounded that I've criticized LEDs, um, but that you, you, you get new modern LEDs now that have uh, sort of an orangey filter, an amber filter. And so they look like the lights to the left, right? It's a, these are actually LEDs to the left, um, but they're not in that blue or spectrum. And, and so this technology is, is just as affordable and it's just as energy efficient, uh, but it's not in the, in the more light polluted categories or more harsh lights. And so uh, again, you know, sort of be on the lookout for that, for that kind of thing. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. And so, so that was a like a uh, uh, a soft touch treatment of of some of the the biology, if I if I can, and then also some of the um, um, practical solutions. But I hope that gives you a quick overview of why we think light pollution is is emerging as a as a global change driver. Um, yeah, and, and and thanks to the people involved. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, that that was really great. If if any of you have questions. Please won't you use the chat function or the Q Q and A function? Um, that that was really fascinating, and uh, I can relate to a lot of what you were talking about. Um, just at your home, I mean, do do people come around and sort of trip over things? You said you've got a, a few lights, but outside, <laughs> just honestly, um, how do, how does it look at your home? And maybe you can stop the share screen so we can talk to each other. Oh yeah, yeah sure. No worries. I yeah, it's 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 been a bit of a war with my mates because uh, most of the lights are now always off at our house, um, and I have this weird way, uh, pathway, and people have, I've had like a toe broken and people trip and stuff. There might have been wine involved. That's what I blame. It's not the lighting. Um, but um, yeah, I guess um, the the biggest story there is is why those lights are needed in the first place. And so in our case, you know, people say, oh, it's the water for animals. You know, you have to keep safe uh, and you have to put the lights on so they left and stay away. I don't think they re that, that really works. Um, the other one, of course, which we haven't touched on is, is crime and crime prevention. People, you know, feel the need um, to keep lights on. And I understand that, you know, there's, there, there's some good work on the, the psychology behind that. Of course, you feel more safe in a, in a lived environment as, as a species, you know, where we can see what's, what's happening. But, but I could, you know, scientifically, this is a very difficult problem to study is to try and understand, um, you know, if you switch off lights in a neighborhood, do the crime rates increase? You can't ethically do an experiment like that. So that, that's, that would just be absurd. Um, and so places where people have been able to study it, in fact, the lighting that deters crime is the non-directed lighting. So that's motion activated, um, for instance, as soon as the light comes on, suddenly it's attention and says, hey, something's up, rather than constantly illuminating the place. Um, and then you know things are normal, and so those those sort of trade-offs. The the like I said, the literature is, is is a bit obscure for that, but I think I'm, I'd rather err on the side on the side of that. Um, um, so there's a question. Yeah, uh, highways and bypasses and main arteries seem to be lit with orange lights. Would this make a difference to the environment? For instance, insects, life cycles, bats around these light well, sources. That is a fascinating question, right? And so. Um, if I, can, if I can go all the way back and maybe talk it from an engineering perspective. And so what the engineers, I, I don't know this could happen, right? But they study like, for instance, if you're driving through a tunnel, like through the, in, in one or whatever, the tunnel, the spacing of those lights and the speed what you're driving can induce um, epileptic seizures in people at the speed at what the lights flash and come through, right? And so there's, there's, they literally do work to space these lights out together uh, to make it look uh, so it doesn't induce people into seizures. I mean, if that's the case, you know, I'm just like, wow, this, this is really important. Um, and so as to your question about those, those softer lights, um, yeah, of course, a, a lot of the newer lights are LEDs because they're cheap. Um, and so a lot of the new technology comes with these colors and LED lights. Um, and then the street scale level, I, the only work I know people have done on is on, on springtails, and, and so that's a ground living vertebrate that most people have never heard of. Um, but under street lights, they, the communities change, and the species that benefits the most are in fact the invasive species. So the cosmopolitan invasive species outcompete the native species under artificial orange lights. Uh, I thought that was, that was fascinating. Um, I'm sure you're asking in a South African sense, but, but you know, how, how that would play out at scale, I'm not sure. But, but certainly, I mean, if, if it's true for, for these species. Um, and some of the work in South Africa, just, just as a side, was done in, in some stadiums, some of Corey Schumann's work, um, and how different bats react to these LED lights, you know, these massive floodlights that go, go on. Um, and of course, it attracts different bat species. Some of them benefit from it, right? So they have increased buses, Increased feeling because they attract to the insects, but some of them just, just disappear. Um, um, Bernard, we've got Ian here is asking Is it scientifically better for us to watch TV and cell phone screens in a well lit room or just in the dark, uh, kind of looking at the screen? 
That's a great question. I, I, I'm not sure. I, I, you know, look, with, with all this stuff, there's, there's a, I guess, a bit of a trade-off, right? I prefer to watch, I, I'm, a, I'm a cinemaphobe, and so I, I really enjoy it for, and I prefer to do that in a dark room just for the atmosphere and the ambience. Um, I think the important thing is the, is the timing of it rather than the, the you know, um, and, and thinking about the sort of light. Michael and I were earlier talking about the, the blue filters that are now coming almost standard in a lot of Mac products. Uh, I was saying some phone, for instance, that you can put on this blue filter so it cuts out the blue spectrum light at certain times of the day. And so certainly the, 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 the engineering world is really responding very quickly to these, um, these sort of needs. I mean, I, I'm not aware of any work specifically testing that, but, but uh, I would love to know the answer as well. Because Lynn, Lynn wrote as well in the chat, she says, um, thanks for excellent presentation, but blue light glass protectors work very well for, for, for them. And I know that you can buy different glasses and um, that sort of thing, but can you just sort of simply, um, um, uh, to affect your lights, you sort of paint lights. I've seen that at lodges for, for turtles or, or other things, but are you talking more just about blue? Um, on your screens, you can affect what sort of light is on it, but um, have you tried the glasses out or things like that that people say will help? Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I'm aware of them, but I, I haven't tried it out myself. Um, I, I know a lot of people use them, and, and, and it's, it stops all the other things like fatigue, just your eye fatigue and you know, feeling tired and that kind of thing. So, of course, that's, that's something, to, something to think about. Um, the sort of changes I'm talking about is, is, is literally swapping light bulbs, right? And so it's just, you know, instead of having all the LEDs strung out all the place, just, just put soft the incandescent lights in there. And so, like I say, some of the LED lights now come in the correct spectral signatures, which is really what you want. Um, so it's, you know, they're cheap and energy efficient, but, but not as hard. And Alma Marie's asking here, Bernard, she says that when she goes camping, um, they often use the, the red lights around the camp um, uh, and are much better than orange and yellow lights in not attracting as many insects. Why would that be? Absolutely. It's, it's a, it's, um, I didn't touch on this at all. And so in the environment I live in, that's a really big issue, right? And so initially, you know, people have these massive spotlights and they're going around in the game drive vehicles and they zoom, you know, maximum LED so you can see your leopard and things. But it really disturbs the animals, right? So the night show, for example, like that, for instance, you shine that white light on that animal, just freezes and it blinds them. And so, um, I mean, you know, what we think would be cool to demonstrate is if you, you know, if you flash a few impala, do the leopards pick it up and they, they, then they can easily catch, um, catch those animals. But how to do that, I don't know. As to your question, yes, I think, I think it gets down to the, what I call the spectral signatures. And so red is on the opposite side of the, the, the spectral um, bands. And so it just doesn't have as strong a, a uh, German word is Zeitgeber. So it's not as strong a cue for, for, for species and for animals. And so I do the same thing, you know, if you put on your head door, you put on the red filter when you're viewing animals or when you're reading or whatever, because it just reduces uh, the amount of insects, right? Because uh, they're not as strongly attracted to it or disorientated by it. Not all species are attracted by that. Mm -hmm. And, and do you think a sort of law is going to come out? You said uh, some of the big corporations out there are sort of waiting for this thing to happen and they've got stockpiles of the, of the warmer lights ready to go. Do you think we'll get to a point where we say, look, this is what we need and uh, someone just sort of makes that call? Would I, I, I mean, like, uh, if you say we, do you mean South Africa or, or Africa? Yeah, or, you know. Around the world. You know, I think, I think um, you know, at the moment, I... I, I it's such a new issue in South Africa. I don't know if it's really, if it's really taking, you know, uh, or it's getting the credit it deserves. I know certainly in, in, in some European cities, the municipalities are adopting specific lighting types um, for the health of their citizens. That's the motivation. And so if you, uh, the, and you can see this from space. So, so Berlin, for instance, has a different spectral signature to Leipzig because uh, the municipalities there are adopting different lights. The reason they're doing this is because I think it could be linked to carcinogenic risk. And so if you can provide the same sort of safety of, of the lights and you can light it up and it's still energy efficient but cheaper, but you, you're sort of getting the most bang out of your back by, by ensuring that your, your health risks are less, then you should invest in it. And so, so some of the more progressive economies are adopting this. Um, and the word on the street is, uh, again, I think this, is, this might, you know, uh, it's hard to verify, but that a lot of the, the big companies are stockpiling uh, the more, warmer glow lights 
because they they anticipating that the market will shift as as people, especially in Europe and America, are, are more consciously adopting lights that aren't as pollutant. It's fascinating. Um, the final question from my side. Uh, I know you're passionate about wilderness and you spend time in dark places like, I think it's Antarctica you said you, you spend time in. Um, do you think we'll get to a point where these places are just protected from light, you know, and maybe they are more valuable, these, these farmlands in the Karoo or in the Cedarburg or places because, I mean, they're harsh environments, that's why there's no one there, but there's this value because they are completely pure in that sense of, of there not being any lights or there might be laws passed to protect the lights. But they're not being yeah. it's, it's a complicated question because, because how you assess that value is, is, is a, I guess it's value for whom, you know. Um, so, so, so me as somebody who likes those regions, uh, yes, I, would, I'd, I'd hope so. I'd hope they, they stay wilderness and stay, stay wild. Um, but of course, there's a, there's a need to, to balance all these things against developmental, sorely needed developmental uh, trajectories that need to be expanded and, and economic development that, that much of Africa sorely, sorely needs. And so they, they, I guess it's, it's a question of trade-off. Um, I think what, what, what is scary is that uh, colleagues of mine have demonstrated just to what extent the natural lights in protected areas are eroding because of lights outside. And so technically, you know, we, we sit and look at it spatially and say, oh, but the habitat is still intact. But from the perspective of species, it's not anymore because the light regimes are changing so much. And it's something like 80% of, 85, 87% of all mammal distributions now are under light polluted skies, right? So all animals are perceiving this now. Uh, we're systematically changing uh, the world. And I guess the point is, you know, to what extent is that uh, impacting species and us? That's, that's really what the, where the rub lies. And I think what's really fascinating about what you, you've told us is about the need for research, right? And I know you're yeah. passionate about this. We need, we need the data. We need the science. And, uh, you know, as, as you said, we, we're studying in the day when, when we should be doing a lot more at night. So we wish you the best of luck. Uh, thank you for inspiring us and, and sort of shedding light on the subject. And I really hope that you are able to do a lot more work in this area and that it does become a lot more topical. Bernard, I think we've lost you. <laughs> but that might be a good way to end the conversation. So thank you everyone for joining us. I'm not sure quite what happened there. I think Bernard entered his own uh, Earth Hour. And uh, join us in two weeks' time for a conversation about coelacanth. Thanks so much. Keep well. And thank you, Bernard, again for your time, if you can hear us. All the best.